So, good uh, morning, everyone. I very much appreciate your presence here on the day, on the morning after the night before. And the competition is very stiff. There is wonderful sun, there is beer, there is fire pong, and then there is me. So, thank you so much. Um, while all the lovely people are setting up, ah, we're good. Thank you so much. Um, it's the social technical evolution that we're going to talk about. And uh, why? And why am I doing that? Well, I'm an associate professor at the University of Delft, so this is my work. But I'm also a dad, a blacksmith, a hacker, and just somebody who hangs out on EMF campus, having a good time. So let's just dive straight into it and start thinking about this fairly weird topic of evolution and technology in society. So it all started, of course, late 19th century. And Charles Darwin, you all know him, um, basically said, well, let uh, live very multiply, let the weakest the strongest live and the weakest die. And the interesting thing about this is that Darwin had absolutely no idea about genes, had no, about, no idea about informational nature of evolution. It was really just basically Darwin sort of running around and looking at pigeons, right? And pigeons are pretty awesome. They, they can cover entire cities in crap. That's better than most people can. Um, so that's, that's interesting. So how does one even go from studying pigeons to thinking about the evolution of society and the evolution of these large-scale socio-technical systems of which we are part of. So let's just kind of unpack that a little bit and have a bit of a discussion. And if you have any questions, feel free to just raise hands and don't throw things. At least let me know you're throwing things so I can duck. Um, so let's make it fairly interactive, okay? So the first thing that I want to point out when we talk about evolution, it's really an algorithm, right? And it's an algorithmic process of replication, variation, and selection. And it's not the answer to the how did we get here. It is the answer to the how did we get here, not the why are we here question. And some of the things that sort of the creationists, the fundamentalists really get wrong is that they think, well, it's the reason why we're here. And then they get all upset because it's supposed to be this bearded guy that makes things happen. But actually, it's not, a, you know, if, if God was uh, there and it was really doing all of this, this would be the way to do it because it's, a, it's about an algorithm, a program, you start and then just lean back and do nothing. It's going to watch it happen, right? So it's a process, it's the mechanism by which we are here, not the reason why we're here or the direction to which we're going. So once we understand this evolutionary, this algorithm, let's just kind of unpack it a bit more to just lay the groundwork so we can talk about it. Now, Evolution is not teleological, it's not goal-oriented, it doesn't have a grand purpose. If it had, there would be the shark bear octopus, right? Because the shark bear octopus is absolutely awesome and I wish I had one as a pet. But it's not there. And why it's not there? Because its evolution is a local optimizer. It's, it's a process, an algorithm that serves, the, serves a problem that an organism or a species or a thing is facing right now. Actually, it is the pro it's solving the problem the thing was facing, your parents were facing, right? So I'm trying to survive here. I try to make more babies because that's what evolution is all about. And what is the best I can do with my biological makeup given the current conditions of temperature, pressure, predation, whatever, right? So the other thing to realize is that every living thing is as, as advanced as every other living thing, right? People think, oh, humans are the most advanced race. Well, spiders are pretty awesome too, and so are bacteria, because they've been around much longer and are far more fine-tuned, far more evolved, far more algorithmed out, if you wish, than we are. So it's all on the same frontier of this algorithm, right? So there's no better. There is just more or less suited, right? So when, when uh, Discovery Channel talks about the ultimate predator, the white shark, that's not so ultimate if you take a white shark, put it in the Sahara Desert, it will be dead in three minutes. So not so awesome then, are you, right? Likewise, if you were the, I don't know, the big lion, the, the ultimate predator of the African desert, stick it into five kilometers water, it's not very optimal, is it? Right, so it's, evolution is about right here, right now, what works? Okay. The other thing about this, uh, this algorithm is that it, it is intractable. Any computer scientists, mathematicians in the room? There you go. So you know about uh, uh, intractability, right? And about an, an, an non-MP completeness. And that's, this is the ultimate non-MP complete algorithm. And why? Well, because it's the things doing things to other things, reacting to things that have done before and that might be doing in the future, and all of this interacting soup. 
And that's what makes it really, really difficult. Let me just show you just how badly intractable it really is. So here is, here is us this morning at zero. Yeah? And uh, the point A is now, are you going to listen to this lecture or not? Maybe you're bored, maybe you think I have a stupid t-shirt, so you decide to leave, right? Now, but let's say you decide to stay, which I think is awesome. Now, at, the, at this time, outside the tent is the love of your life, right? But you did not going to, you're not going to make them, meet them because you are here. So I'm sorry for that. But that means that this entire tree, sort of for you to the left, of A is not going to happen. That future is, is not possible. You will not create the next baby Einstein. You will, it will not go on to save the world. You will be in the stand stuck with me getting baked in the sun. However, the person next to you, okay, you get it, right? So every time something happens, an infinite number of other things cannot happen, and then yet another infinite number of things might happen because of the constant interactions right here, right now. And it is this exploding space of possibilities as things interact with each other that makes it so difficult to think about evolution because it's always things reacting to other things and evolving and adapting and changing over time. Now, just to give you some numbers because numbers are fun, um, there's this, uh, just chaps at Princeton that, that has done the math here and they said, well, let's imagine this Uber computer, right, that has every electron in the universe and there's 10 to the power of 79 of those. That's a lot of electrons. And each of them has a computational power of today's fastest computer. So that's 10 to the power of 12 instructions per second. And they run for the entire age of the universe, right? That's 10 to the power of 108 computations, which is that number below. Yeah? Oh, sorry. And then if you imagine the evolutionary algorithm running for, of 100 things interacting over 100 time steps, the number of possible permutations and pathways that that evolutionary process could have is that number below. Yeah, that took a while, and there are exactly 199 zeros there. Yeah. So you cannot compute, predict. So that's the thing with evolution. You have to just go through this process, and, and in order to understand where it's going, you have to understand its past, and you cannot exactly predict. Now, in order to experience that a little bit, I would like to propose that we play a little game. Uh-oh, now we've got to do stuff. So what I would like you to do is to stand up and come here in front and stand in a circle. Can you do that? Lovely. So just a, one big circle, please. And if it gets too busy, then, then don't come because then we're going to. So don't trip because you will be playing a game called Attacker Defender. Now, because of the computer mess up, I don't have my slides on screen, so I'm apologies. So what I want you to do now, are you good? Okay, just come on, fill up here, fill up here as well, don't be shy. We will play this game called the Attacker Defender game. Yeah? We'll do this slowly, quietly, it's too hot to run around. What you will do is you will pick out two people. Please just look around and just pick two persons, any two persons. Not all the same cute guy or girl, but whatever, yeah? Now, the first person you picked is the defender, like a big shield, right? So I hope you picked a big person. The other one is the bad guy or girl. That's the attacker. Does that make sense? OK? So defender and the attacker. Now you are the target. Yeah? So what I want you to do now, and please do it safely and slowly, move around so that you keep the defender between you and the attacker. Can you do that? Go. Easy, 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 don't run, don't run. <laughs> or if you're running, please make sure you're carrying scissors. <laughs> okay, stop, it's hammer time. Now, now, we will change the rules. The defender is now the target. Okay, defender is now the target. You are the defender. Move so that you keep yourself between the attacker and the target. Okay, the defender is now the target. You are the defender. Move so that you keep yourself between the attacker and the target. Go. <laughs> I 
Okay, you're absolutely awesome. Thank you so very much. Applause for yourself. <laughs> Please go back. Okay. Thank you so very much. So, what happened? What was this? Anyone? What was the first state we had? Yes, there was a hand in the back, please. Exactly right. So when the, the first set of rules makes you interact in ways that you spread out, yeah? When I change the rules, just interaction changes, suddenly you coalesced into this group and you physically cannot be inside each other, so you have to kind of bump around, yeah? Now, if I had the video, I would show you a simulation, which I cannot now. But just, just think about it. Do you know whose attacker you were? Do you know whose defender you were? No. What happens if you move and you are somebody's defender? Then the attacker has to follow you, right? So every single motion by every one of you instantaneously affects absolutely everybody else without you even realizing it. Because the only thing you're doing is you're keeping track of the two people and trying to stay aligned there. But every motion of everybody, because we're in this big network, moves all of us. Right? So that's kind of the interactability of the soft systems is every one move motion, every one change affects everybody else without you realizing it. And that means that these evolving systems, because of such properties, and now we do not have any learning and adaptation, and normally we have all of that as well, makes it impossible to predict. And this is thanks to Perry Bible Fellowship. Uh, it fell off the, uh, uh, the, what you call it, the, the, the link to them. A wonderful cartoon. This is exactly what they're trying to depict. So this brings me to, oh no, I'm gonna skip this, I'm sorry. This brings me to this notion of a coupled fitness landscape. Okay, so this is a concept from evolutionary theory that says, well, as any, uh, every entity acts, interacts, moves, and changes, it constantly deforms the fitness landscape of all the others. So let's say that I am a gazelle, a fairly chubby, hairy gazelle, but fair enough. And then there's lions, yeah? And what's my goal in life is to eat grass and make baby gazelles. What's your goal in life? Well, is to eat, eat gazelles like me and make more lions. That's what evolution is about. So it means that if I learn how to run faster, you go hungry and don't get to have any babies, but I get to have, I get to live and have babies. So as my fitness increases, I become more fit adaptable, your fitness decreases. Now, then maybe you say, well, as a bunch of lions, let's figure out how to cooperate and corner this really fat and hairy gazelle that can take really sharp turns and run really hard. As you learn how to cooperate, my fitness goes down because now I'm breakfast and not making any babies, your fitness goes up. So we have these coupled landscapes of who is doing well, who is doing poorly, and of course while the lions and gazelles are fighting, the grass is doing its own thing and being more or less eaten. Does that make sense? Yeah? Which is kind of what happened in the game, right? So you're, as you're moving, you're exposing your uh, your target, which then it's the fitness decrease, they're more vulnerable, they have to adapt, they change, and thus moving the whole system around. Now that's the essence of these fitness landscapes, and this is what drives the interactability of evolution, because you're interacting across these spaces. Now, how does evolution work? Well, because of this algorithm of, of transferring inf information across, and it starts in layers, it starts in what we call meat, right? So it's DNA in organisms, yeah? Now, the thing with DNA, it's a quaternary-based digital information, so it's CATAG, the four uh, um, amino acids, and they form, they're basically universal to all living things. And there is this, you know, it's an analog fitness function, so uh, am I fit enough to reproduce? How many kids did I have? The more I have, the more chance of me, them being better. And the physical environment and other things around me affect how good I'm doing. And the result is digital. Right, so yes babies, no babies. Now as, the, as we go through this evolutionary dance, affecting each other, evolving slowly, we find strategies how to deal with things. Now the human strategy for dealing with life, universe, and everything else is to develop an intelligence and to become generalists. Right, we're not particularly good at anything like having big claws or running really far. We are, however, creating culture because we can tell stories to each other and then we create the system 
network of minds, language, and meaning through which information now can flow. Now, if I was a buffalo, the only way to teach you something was to have a baby together, right? And that only works if you're female because, well, otherwise, no babies, yeah? So that restricts the amount of information uh, that can be transferred, and it's vertical, it goes across time. However, in culture, because we have this shared space and we all know who this chap is, and I don't even have to explain it to you, right? We can have a horizontal information transfer within a very limited amount of time between the same sexes. Without, there is no need for sexual reproduction. We could just talk to each other. And, you know, like we could have a conversation about Michael Jackson. I assume nobody met Michael Jackson, right? I've never met him. Anybody? No? You will never meet him again, right? Unfortunately. Yet we could spend the rest of the day talking about it. That's kind of weird, right? How come that we can have this access to this shared information space without actual physical experience? And that's what culture is all about, about enabling us to do stuff together. Now, what makes it even more interesting is that what is fit, what is adjusted, what is, what is good in culture is reflexive. It's we decide what is okay. Right? Buffalo don't get to decide that it's not okay for lions to eat them. Yeah, that they just have, they have no choice. Communities can decide what are appropriate rules of behavior and what means to be successful or not. So it's a reflexive feedback process. And as I said, it goes both horizontal in time, so within five minutes, and it can be stored and replicated over time. So that's interesting. But of course, that whole cultural thing is embedded in meat, right? I'm a meat-based organism. I walk around, I sweat, I have blood, all of those things. Now, on top of that, being at the technology festival, there is the technological layer. Now, there are people who argue that teams, as units of technological evolution, are a thing and if that's true, then what you're looking at is a smartphone holding its private parts, right? So basically, people argue that this technology using us to make more of itself. So we are the sexual reproductive organs of technology, right? So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm currently using here, let's do some commercials, the latest OnePlus 3 telephone because I think it's awesome. My wife has the previous version because she doesn't care. Right? So I'm actually actively reproducing the Oppo 3 because now I'm also advertising it as well. So because of that, there might be more sales. Because there's more sales, there might be next version. And it becomes an own system of replication, variation, and selection on top of culture, on top of meat. And these layers going back and forth is what gives you interaction. So let me just go back a couple of slides and show you this one. Right? So the layers of emergence here as we talk about them, it all starts, of course, with elementary particles, right? Stuff doing stuff to other stuff. And at, uh, at that level, you end up with things like atoms. Lots of interaction, a structure appears. Now, put lots of atoms together, and suddenly we start calling this thing chemistry. It's still just atomic, subatomic particles interacting, creating patterns. Now, more chemistry interacting, we get these structures called biological cells. Now, put lots of cells together, interacting in various ways, you start getting organisms. Start putting lots of organisms interacting together, you get Dutch football fans. It's an unfortunate result of evolution, but yet there is. Um, so, these layers of embeddedness is what drives the evolution of these systems, okay? Now, as we go through time and space, as these nested interactors of meat, culture, technology, adapting and changing and learning, experiencing the external environment, we go through these cycles um, that uh, Holling has identified through these four phases. When you, let's say, imagine there is a fr freshly plowed field. Right? There's nothing there, just soil. What happens slowly is the, what's so-called exploration. Life emerges, there's seeds in the ground, there's energy coming in, and pioneer plants come up, right? It's the, the brambles, the, the, the um, how you call them? The prickly things. Um, please help me. The nasty stuff that gets you all red if you prick nettles. nettles, thank you, yes, nettles. Nettles are exactly the kinds of plants that just colonate. They create structure. There's literally physical structure there that captures the energy. As it captures the energy, information is being processed, more nettles are being made. Uh, this energy starts getting conserved. You start, start getting brushes, you start uh, sh shrubs, you slowly start getting trees that capture even more energy, and they calcify and ossify, become strong and static. Think about societies, right? You started Mad Max world, slowly there's organization, there's structure, suddenly Catholic Church, and governments, and organizations, and Brexit and stuff. 
So systems are all organized tight. Now what happens when systems get over organized and over static? They cannot resist external change and they break. This is your forest fire that suddenly releases the energy that's stored in these systems. They then have to readapt, reorganize, and the cycle starts again. Now keep in mind, all of this is biogeochemical, socio-technical, right? So it's things, planet Earth, people, technology, all wrapped up in one, adapting and learning and changing. Now all of these things happen at short scales, but also at very long scales, right? Societies rise and fall, collapse, reorganize, and grow again. To give you an example, here's some nestedness in time and population. So you can see the fads over there, right? So you need little internet memes. You'll have things like values that slowly adapt and change as they're selected in or out. We, you know, we used to think it was a great idea to help women not to vote. Well, thankfully, we decided that's a bad idea. We don't do that anymore. Society changes and adapts as a result of that. We will hopefully learn that maybe racism is a bad thing to have, and we will one, one day drop it as a society. And of course, because you're dealing with six billion people over long periods of time, these things take time. So you see the traditions in the decades and the billions of people. Right? And again, this is all nested within the biological time scale, which is even slower. I mean, if you think about it, that we left Africa some 40 to 100,000 years ago. That's about 2,000 generations ago. Your average bacterium does that in two days. Right? So in biological terms, we just left Africa. It was like yesterday. So in many ways, biologically, we are very ancient, yet our culture is much, much faster. So that gives rise to this lot of societal problems, because you have this nestedness and what's called paste layering or shearing layers that uh, Stuart Brand talks about this. So on the bottom line, you have bottom layer, there is nature, you know, rocks, biology that very slowly changes. It, it takes at a very different clock. On top of it, there's culture, right? Catholic Church, favorite thing to bash, has been around for more than 2,000 years and has no plans of leaving anytime soon. So it's a big organization, sort of societal structure that very slowly adapts. On top of it, there's governance. How do we get organized? Nation states come and go. But as they're so on top of that, you have your infrastructure, so that our, our cables, our roads, our IT networks, all of that stuff, commerce, quick exchanges on top of it, and then things like fashion and fads on top of it. Now, as these things are moving and changing, they're literally dragging on the lower layer. See what's happening now with, let's say, the file sharing and the slowly changing legal regimes that are constantly trying to limit it, while at the same time, we're inventing better and better ways to share files more and more anonymously because we think it's a cool thing to do. So that's slowly dragging onto, onto the technology. It's slowly dragging on the infrastructure. It will eventually slowly drag on the Catholic Church as well. When Pope has a Tor exit note, that's, that's how we know we won. But that will take a while. Yeah? An example that you can use to think is like a house. So that's the other image. You have a site, so the physical layer is there. You have your infrastructure of the house, the walls that are fairly static. You don't change it very quickly. But things like the, uh, the services in the house, the space plan, you can fairly easily remodel. And you can move the furniture any day if you want. Yeah? Again, remember, these things are embedded biogeotechnical systems, so it's technology within culture, within biology. Now, why evolution and why socio-technical? What starts happening here is that on one side, you have the physical world, right? And us being physical, biological entities are profoundly physical. So let's say a proposition is literally something you put in front. Proposition. So you, you, we even think in terms of physical interactions and physical spaces. So the, the physical world makes us think, allows us to think, and as we think and create, and our thoughts coalesce into technology that has been selected and evolved, we modify the physical world. All right? as, as you build large-scale infrastructures, you make a dam, you fundamentally alter the topology of a space, which then, of course, changes how people can, can or cannot live there, for example, which then changes how they think and feel about things like dams, which then changes how the next dam will be built. Right? So these things co-evolve, they adapt each other, slowly, surely, but that does happen. Now, an example for, is look at US cities versus European cities. Right? Cities have evolved, grown around the dominant transport technology. So if you 
I work in Delft, which is a small medieval city. All the streets are meant for cart, horse carts or push carts and horses. Narrow, twisting alleys. US cities were developed at times of trains and trucks, and they are meant for driving. And they work really well if you're driving. If you walk in the US, that doesn't work very well, right? I mentioned uh, copyright laws and, uh, and, and uh, technology to allow file sharing. These things have been co-evolving very rapidly the last decade. You can really see it happening. Technology also allows some of the evolutionary processes to be jumped over. So if you look at, let's say, uh, mobile banking in Africa, it's a huge thing. Because of the d development issues they had, the physical infrastructure for, say, copper for telephones is not in place. However, it's, they straight went to mobile phones and they do absolutely everything with the mobile phones. And in many ways, Europe is lagging in terms of mobile services compared to stuff that's daily practice in Africa. So suddenly that has caught on. It's changing how they do things, which is going to feed back into technology they're building. So they will never build, probably, a copper wire network. Because why would you? Yeah? Now, so what starts happening as, within this evolving system, various kinds of selection pressures get put on. Right? Because it's, a, it's an evolving system, it responds to pressures on the outside. Now, two extremes. On one side, we have consistent and strong selection pressure, which is capitalist system, right? So you either make money or you go hungry, kind of, in the extreme. So what that means is that the, your fitness landscape is very peaky. There are a couple of really good, optimal places to be at. If you're Facebook, you're doing pretty awesome. If you're Google, you're doing well. If you're a big power, uh, power company or steel mill, you're high up the, the fitness peak, and that's great. However, going from one fitness peak to another fitness peak, so being good at one thing, becoming good at something else, means going through the valley of death, of learning how to climb the other peak, so rearranging, reorganizing yourself. And very few firms that are, operate under very severe short-term economic pressure can ever do that. One famous example that kind of worked was Nokia. You know what Nokia used to make 100 years ago? Anyone? Tires and rubber boots. Tires and rubber boots. There were, there were, if you had Nokia, you were, you were fitted because you had boots up to there, right? And they managed to reorganize and become a telecom company that then did not, was not able to make the next move to smartphones and now is bought up and chewed up and spit out Microsoft, okay? So that's interesting. Now, if you, if you see what happens under this strong economic pressure, you know, people are trying to invent yet a better Facebook. Because if you have to make money, you're very limited in what you can do. The other extreme in terms of socio-economic and socio-technical fitness landscape is what's going on here. Most of us can handle economic pressure fairly well. Right? You have to be fairly wealthy to be here. You have to be able to afford a ticket. You have to be able to afford to travel here. You have to be able to afford not to work, to eat, so you can just play around. But for those that have won in that game, you're experiencing inconsistent and weak selection pressure, right? Because I can stand here and give a lecture, then I can go maybe play with the blacksmiths a little bit, then maybe I'll go watch fire pong, be a generalist, learn a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and I can be fairly okay-ish at things, but I'm okay-ish at many, 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 many different things. And the valleys between the peaks are very shallow. Does that make sense, right? So you're able to surf this landscape as a hacker and be able to combine different things and explore things because you're experiencing a different kind of environment than, let's say, a firm that has this very severe strong selection pressure. Which means that we are behaving in different ways because of that. Does that make sense? Now, so what is that we as a hacker community are really kind of doing this thing? Well, the first thing is that, you know, selection. Well, we drive adoption and preservation of technology. So both ways. Look at Awesome Retro, right? Because of continuous efforts, you can play an arcade game that has been around for 30, 40 years in some cases. So suddenly that meme that the, or the team, the technological meme is there. Look at all the efforts to um, bring back emulators, right? There, and there's a service now you can send a file off to the website that will convert it, into, uh, put it into Atari, and give your, uh, um, uh, send you back the song as an MP3, right? So it's keeping it alive. It's making things around that would not be around otherwise. We're also messing with the fitness landscape, right? If you are working in crypto, for example, and you're creating good cryptography for journalists, suddenly 
what a journalist could not get away with because of state control now can get away because you're actively modifying and increasing the survival rates. So we're actively messing with what's fit, what's unfit. We are punishing, we, Anonymous goes out and punishes companies that don't like or they go after uh, Scientology, for example, because they're selling lies and they actively attack them and expose them and do things. So they're changing what's okay, what's not okay. And the question is how, how directed and aware are we of these things that we do? The other thing is about, of course, replication. Think about open source. And one of the wonderful things about it is that so extremely allows knowledge transfer. And that's why it's such a radical idea because the replication is actively encouraged. Uh, things like responsible disclosure, you're just throwing things out there, making sure other people know what's going on, allow them to replicate what you're doing. Things like mods, game mods or whatever, all these events are all about replication and interaction. And then variation. There is this notion that innovation is all about the adjacent possible. Right, so Pokemon, everybody knows about the game, the Pokemon Go, right? How is that thing possible? Well, there is this technology that has, allows us to have a screen. There's a battery technology that has lots of power in a small package. Oh, we have this GPS thing. Oh, we have cameras. Oh, wait, but if I combine these three, four, five things, suddenly something new appears. And now I have traffic jams because people slam brakes because the Pikachu is on the road, right? Which then, of course, means that it's going to be banned soon because it's causing trouble. So you get all of these interacting waves. Does that make sense? And, you know, just innovating, recombining, you know, there was the previous talk, right, was about having MATLAB, having Raspberry Pi, having all these existing things, and clever recombinations create new things which then can be brought on. And if you look at, look at it, it is exactly what biology is doing, right? So biologists often say that evolution is more and more variation and less and less themes, right? So every vertebrate, everything that has a spine, has the same design, head, forward-facing eyes, four limbs. Now, whether you're a giraffe or a mouse, you're basically the same. It's just kind of stretched out in different interesting directions, adapted to different environments. And if you look at things like the eye, you know, the creationists love to talk about irreducible complexity. Well, if you look at the eye, you find out that all the bits of the eye have been reused somewhere else in the body to do other things, but have been recombined in interesting ways to give new functions, which then allow suddenly yet more things to happen. Now, and what I would like to leave you with is this notion from Daniel Dennett, one of the greatest thinkers alive, I feel, who said that now, for the first time in its billions of years of history, our planet is protected by far-seeing sentinels able to anticipate danger from a distant future, a comet on a collision course or global warming, and devise schemes for doing something about it. The planet has finally grown its own nervous system, us. And I do challenge you to think about this statement later on and to think about what is your role in the evolving adaptive nervous system on the planet that we all are. And with that, I thank you very much and I leave you with a kitten. Oh, complex Evo is my Twitter handle. And thank you. Okay, do we have any questions at all? Hang on a second. As long as you can hear me. <laughs> Sorry, Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, what about the biohacking? How does this affect evolution? That's a, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, it depends who you talk to. So it is very difficult to be objective about these things. But let me say the two extreme things. You have sort of the hardcore Greenpeace stance that says it is evil, period. Anything that's GMO, it's bad and should disappear. Okay, I mean, there are, there are reasons why you want, might want to think that. On the other side, people say, well, the planet Earth is one big biological mess, right? I mean, the notion of species is a very leaky notion, and bacteria, g bacterial genomes can be found in human DNA, and it's all a, sort of a, one big orgy of information transfer. So in many ways, I would say, well, biohackers are just surfing that wave and just doing what nature does anyway. Just doing it more purposefully and with more sort of, more playfulness maybe, because you can do things that nature normally wouldn't make because they're ineffective or you know, mice don't have to glow green. So 
it is really just exploring to me. It's really exploring that adjacent possible. Can I make new weird combinations? And personally, I'm, you know, if, if, if done right, I don't see problems with GMOs. If done right, that's a big if, right? There is lots of reasons why you don't want to do things like Monsanto is doing, for example. But that's more about control and pesticide use and food security rather than GMOs. So I don't know if that answers your question a bit, but yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Ah, there you are. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you for a really fascinating talk, although I disagree with you on many things like Dennett sure. and your explanation of the success of Pokemon. I think Pokemon is a success is due to the meme, to the Pokemon, not to the technology, because people have done this kind of stuff for 10 years and longer and right. have not seen that success. Um, a question, yeah. when, you, when you talked about the, uh, like, like you have a kind of like Darwinism and social Darwinism approach, uh, isn't it that um, the pressure or the reproduction, if you, if you measure everything in reproduction, it gets a bit murky because, for example, in your, in your um, slide, when you work at Facebook, you are at a fitness peak, potentially, uh, but then you work uh, so much that you don't have any time for biological reproduction. You might reproduce uh, memes or, or things like that. So this reproduction, if, if you only look at, at Darwin, it, it gets complicated uh, on the different levels. Okay, thank you for that question. So first about Pokemon, my comment was the, about the adjacent possible. So it's the technologies that make something possible, not about the success. And I fully agree that it's, we had games like that for a long time. I mean, Ingress, if there are Ingress players, you know about it. It's been around, eh? so that's one point. The other thing about, so this social Darwinism as an, as an idea has been very much vilified. Oh, it's going to be about eugenics, and it's going to be about the perfect human, all of that nonsense. It's not about that. To me, the, the usefulness of thinking in terms of evolutionary pressures is to help you understand the patterns and the structures. It's not about designing, right? You don't have the ability to design these things. But it, it, when you try to understand the world around you as a thing that's responding and reacting and adapting, to particular pressures, some of which are bigger than individual, right? That, that's a useful way to think about because then you can understand how things are moving. Now, coming back to the Facebook example, I totally buy your comment on, you know, if you're only working and not reproducing, well, maybe you should be making more babies rather than more Facebook. Um, the, my comment on Facebook being on the top of the fitness peak is about, if you think about in economic terms as an interaction space of firms, at a bigger scale, so things that are you know, organism, economic organisms, they, are, they can only survive by finding the most the highest peak on the landscape that makes the most money. That's why most firms are so ruthless, because they have, they have to, quote unquote. I mean, you can argue that it's humans so and they have a choice, but what happens in this game, for example, we play, because you're locked in the system, you lose ability to control it. I mean, you could have left after the game, but as long as you're playing, you play by the rules and you're, stuck, uh, you, you're locked by the rules. So firms often don't have the space to move because they will die if they leave, if they stop, find, if they stop trying to find the peak. So that was really the essence of my comment, is that they're they're driven by everybody else to try to, to extract maximum value out of society. Otherwise, they fail. And you have to be a very enlightened group of people to be able to say, well, Let's suffer losses for a while to find something that's that's slightly more acceptable. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, then I do thank you very, very much for being here. It's it's lovely that you spend time in the hot tent while there is beer outside. Uh, feel free to talk to me later. I have open access courses, open courseware courses on this stuff, much more extensive if you're interested. So please talk to me about that. Thank you very much.